Good morning, everyone. Uh, is everybody okay this morning? Sure, did you get your coffee? Okay, great. That's important. We need to be awake. We need to be awake this morning. Um, and I want to really welcome you to the 2014 Corn and Wheat Short Course. My name is Brenda Ortiz, and because of my southern accent, that is, is farther south from, from you. Um, and I have been trying to learn from you the accent. I haven't picked up the y'all yet, but I'm trying. Um, I am an associate professor in the Department of Crop, Soil, and Environmental Sciences, Auburn University. I have 75% extension appointment, 25% research appointment, and I work in three areas. So like my colleague uh, from Purdue, Tony Vine, uh, I said that I have three hats. Uh, you know, one day I'm, I'm wearing the, the corn and wheat extension agronomy hat. Uh, the other day I wear the precision agriculture hat. And the next day I wear the climate extension hat. And I try to combine all, all of these things. Uh, um, in order to, to really help you. So um, I, I'm glad you are here. I'm glad you, you take the time to spend two days here with us and with our uh, visitors, uh, professors and scientists from different universities and different institutions um, that I wanna perhaps go ahead and, and, and recognize them uh, here. Um, we have, I feel like, a very good pool of speakers. But I also want to recognize not only the speakers, but also the sponsors that made possible that you are here with us. Um, and I also want to thank um, the team, the team that has been working on preparing this course for you. Um, it's a team effort. My colleagues from Extension, Extension Ages, County Extension Coordinators, um, Extension Administration, Extension Communication, my Extension Specialist colleagues, and my colleagues from the Crop, Soil, and Environmental Sciences Department. And uh, with that, um, I really want to encourage you to ask questions, to take advantage of these people that are going to be with us for the next two days. Uh, take advantage of the breaks that we will have at Ballroom B where, where our sponsors are going to be there also. So meet with our sponsors, meet with the speakers, um, and ask you know, as many questions as, as you can. And I want to invite um, one, one of my, I can say is one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Paul Mask now has a new role uh, he is now the Associate Dean uh, for Extension in the College of Agriculture of Auburn University, and I want him to give us the official welcome for this event. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, it's great to see all of you here. Uh, Brenda has put together a fantastic agenda. I was reading over it early and earlier, and uh, as the former grain specialist, uh, she really uh, outdid anything I ever did. <laughs> so I was a little bit jealous, but um, this doesn't happen uh, without a couple of things. And the first, she mentioned the speakers. I really would like to thank all of the speakers that have agreed to be here to, to make this uh, short course, what, what it will be, but also the sponsors. Uh, Extension uh, has a long history of partnership with industry to, to bring information uh, out. And uh, This year we're celebrating the 100th year of Extension, and we here in Alabama especially have reason to celebrate 
because some of the earliest extension work was done here in Alabama uh, by uh, George Washington Carver. And if you get a chance, there's a small museum in Tuskegee, uh, and it's one of the best small museums uh, I know of. And as an agronomist, you know, there's no greater name than George Washington Carver. And, and so I'm very appreciative of the fact that we have close by here a really uh, good museum that celebrates his work. Um, that he started extension, he developed a concept, he bought a, a wagon and uh, equipped it, uh, and he would take loads of seeds and uh, implements and other uh, things out to the, the producers and the farmers and uh, put in demonstrations and that sort of thing. And his work was part of the, uh, what brought about the creation of Extension. And so uh, throughout the country, in Washington, D.C., and most other states, uh, there have been celebrations this year of the 100th birthday of Extension. But I think the best celebration of all are the, are the kind that we're having here today because Extension has always been about bringing the latest information uh, to the producers, and that's what we're doing here today. So I welcome you here uh, to this uh, uh, short course and really appreciate your attendance and appreciate the efforts of the speakers and Brenda uh, and the sponsors. Thank you. Um, so I would like to invite our first speaker of this morning, uh, Mr. Mark Gold, and he's coming from the company Top Third. He will be speaking about grain marketing strategies. Mark. Well, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'd like to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. My name is Mark Gold. I come to you today from Chicago, city kid, born and raised, went off to University of Illinois and got a degree in agricultural economics. When I graduated, I bought a seat at the Chicago Board of Trade, spent the next 20, 22 years in the pits as a professional trader, left the floor in 1995, got involved working with farmers, and I've been working with farmers ever since, trying to help them do a better job of marketing. How many of you are here this morning because you feel you can do a better job of marketing your crops or livestock? Just about everybody, right? Uh, how many of you out there right now are using futures or options to help you with your marketing? Just a few of you. One's my client. How many of you out there know what a margin call is? Just about everybody, right? And it's okay to answer this next question. How many of you think all the members of the Board of Trade and the Merck are a bunch of thieves and crooks? Well, they aren't thieves and crooks. They're professional businessmen. They are the best in the world at what they do. Today, we have to watch these markets virtually 18 hours a day, five days a week, and your odds of running in and looking at your DTN machine once or twice a day to determine whether or not prices are going up or down or not and try to beat those pros in Chicago, it's probably not going to happen. So we want to get you thinking a little bit differently about marketing than you have before. First of all, where are we right now in these world stocks? The U.S. numbers have come down a little bit. Soybeans on this last report were down to 410. Corn just under 2 billion bushels. Wheat at 654. I wouldn't be as concerned looking at market prices with these U.S. stocks. It's the world-ending stocks that concern me. 2013, we had 173. This year, we've got 192 in the corn. The wheat went from 185 to 195. Beans went from 67 to almost 90 million metric tons of beans. It's not like we're running out of grain out here, folks. Now, production versus marketing. American farmers are the best producers in the world. You guys are going to spend most of this conference learning how to grow bigger and better crops. Growing, it's not the problem. Historically, where do the statistics tell us that the average American farmer sells the majority of his crops every year? In the bottom third of prices that were available to him during the year. 
So hopefully some of the things that we can talk about here today can help you do a better job of marketing. Some of these marketing opportunities are going to come well before you even plant the crops. And you've got to look at these opportunities long before these crops get in the bin. And I know for many of you, your granddad told your dad, and your dad told you, don't sell it till you get it in the bin. And for 150 years, that was great advice. But now with the new insurance policies we have out there, the revenue insurance, we can feel much more comfortable selling grain ahead of time than we ever have before. Now in 2015, you face extraordinary risk out there. The high land prices, the input costs are high, water, seed, land, all of that. You have basis risk, not so much here in the Deep South, but certainly in the Midwest, we have to watch that. And you can't afford to pay these high input costs and then sell your crops at cheap prices. Managing your risk by becoming better marketers is going to be critical to you maintaining your profit margins. Now the current grain fundamentals, the bullish side, we've got good soybean demand, particularly from the Chinese. We have possible reduced acres. It looks like the FSA numbers were, were leaked on Friday. They shaved corn about a million six. They shaved beans about a million three acres. So that's a little bit friendly. Now, as of a half an hour ago, beans were a little bit lower on the day. Corn was about steady. There's some, certainly some quality issues about the corn that's left out there in the fields in the upper north. So all that are the basic bullish fundamentals. Bearish fundamentals, the export demand for corn and wheat has been really very poor this year. We have the strong U.S. dollar, which is certainly limiting the export market, and we have these big world carryouts to contend with. Now, how can you become a better marketer? First of all, you have to spend more time on your marketing plan. How many of you folks in this room right now will spend an hour a week being better marketers? Again, my client, one and one other gentleman in the back. Well, folks, if you want to become a better marketer, you have to spend some time on it. It's not that easy. You're going to have to make some changes. I want you to spend five minutes a day to become a better marketer. Can you handle five minutes a day? If you truly want to become a better marketer, can you handle five minutes a day? I believe you can. Now, I'm asking you to make a little bit of a change in your life, right? Spend five minutes a day doing something you haven't had to do before. I'll tell you something personal about me. I've had to make a few changes in my life. I'll tell you something personal about me. You're looking at a man back in 2001 had four separate open heart surgeries. They cracked me open four times within one year. And I can tell you unequivocally, the only way a man survives four open heart surgeries is through the infinite mercy of Jesus Christ. Now, growing up Jewish in Chicago, and getting baptized late in life and accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior was a bit of a change in my life. I'm not asking you guys to make that big of a change. For example, I'm not going to ask you to convert to Judaism. Trust me, the initiation for the guys is pretty tough, so we won't have you do that. But I want you to spend five minutes a day. Read. We put out an email every night to our clients. You guys will have an opportunity to read that. Uh, we'll let you sign up for it at the table. Uh, when we're done here at the break, take five minutes, read that email, track your basis, start reading some things about marketing, get more involved in it, but you have to spend five minutes a day to become a better marketer. Combine effective crop insurance with your marketing plan. And now we've got the Farm Bill, the ARC, and the PLC out there to deal with. We like our clients to have crop insurance and generally the revenue insurance because we like our clients to have guaranteed bushels that they can sell ahead of time. In the 2014 crop, when was the best time to sell your crop? Back in March, April, May of last year, of the year, long before you harvested these crops. So we want you to look for those opportunities, and when you have crop insurance and guaranteed bushels, we can feel more comfortable selling grain ahead of time. We want to use options to manage risk. And we're going to talk very simply today about options and what they are, and what they can do for you. Has everybody heard the term puts and calls? What's a put and what's a call? I want you to think about a put option just this simply. It's an insurance policy that you can buy today to protect the price of your crops or livestock until you sell it in case the price goes down. It's an insurance policy. So today we have December 15 corn out here at about 420 a bushel. 
if you could buy a $4 put for 25 cents and net put in a 375 floor on your corn, if corn goes to three bucks this year or 250 this year, you're protected at four dollars. If corn goes to five dollars or six dollars like we would like it to, you're going to lose the 25 cents you paid for that insurance policy, but you have the corn to sell up here at five or six dollars a bushel. Everybody understand that? It's an insurance policy to protect your unsold bushels. We buy put options to protect anything that's unsold. So if you've got grain in the bin from 14 that you haven't sold, we need some puts on that. If you're planning on raising grain in 2015, we need some puts on that grain that you're going to raise in 2015, and we need it right now. So the put option is your insurance policy in case prices go down. What's a call option? I want you to think about a call option just this simply. It's a lottery ticket. Now, I don't know if any of you guys or gals in this crowd have bought a lottery ticket, but we have the Powerball in Illinois. And I've spent a buck or two bucks trying to win $300 million or $400 million. Did I expect to win $300 or $400 million? No, I didn't. But I was in the game. So once you've sold this crop, let's say you say to me, hey, Mark, you know, December 15 corn's out here at 420, and I got a pretty good basis. Why don't I just sell it now? Because if I don't, if I buy your put, I'm potentially leaving about 45 cents on the table. Okay, you want to pull the trigger? <clears throat> go sell some corn right now, go ahead and do it. Now that you've sold the grain, we'll look at buying the call option to replace it. If we've got December corn here at 420, maybe we buy a 450 call option for 20 cents. So if corn does go to 550 or 650 or seven bucks this year, we have that lottery ticket in our pocket in case there's higher prices. So those are the basics on the options. The put option is your insurance policy case the price goes down. Once you've sold the grain, we look at buying the call option as your lottery ticket in case there's a jackpot out there. Now, what are the three greatest advantages when you buy an option? Let's say, for example, you plan to raise 50,000 bushels of corn next year. And I just told you, let's say it's 20 cents a bushel to buy the put option. Each contract at the Board of Trade is for 5,000 bushels. So if you're raising 50,000 bushels, you'd need 10 contracts of these put options. 20 cents a bushel is $1,000 a contract times 10 contracts. You'd need to write out a check for $10,000 plus my commission. I charge $37.50 for each contract you buy or sell. In this case, you're buying 10 contracts. My commission would be $375. So you write out that check for $10,375. Now you're protected if corn goes to three bucks or 250 this year. Now, you've just written out that check. There are three great advantages when you buy these options. The number one advantage with any option you buy is that you will never, ever get a margin call, period. All of you folks knew what a margin call was. So when you spend that money, you know exactly what you're getting into. You won't ever get a margin call if you buy the option. The second great advantage with the option is you have the upside open to you. A lot of you guys are scared to sell grain because you're worried about, gee, if I sell my corn at 420, what if it goes to six bucks this year? You feel like you're missing something out there. So you sell the corn, if you buy the call option, you still have the upside open to you. If you don't sell the grain and you've got that put option on, if the market goes up, you're gonna have five or six dollar corn open to you. So in either case you play this game, you have the upside open to you in the market. The third great advantage of buying the option is the time value. If we go out and buy that December 15 put today, that gives us almost one year of protection between now and next December. So if we have another 175 bushel yield in this country, or even higher, I mean, let's face it, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan all got their yields kicked down because of bad weather. What if they would have had good weather, like the rest of the Midwest? Can we have 180, 185 bushel corn in this country? You bet we can. So would it make, for you, young lady, would it make your life easier if you knew that every day between now and next December, if corn does go to 3 bucks or 250 you're protected here at $4. 
But if corn goes to five or seven dollars this year, you still have the corn to sell up there. Does that make your life easier or harder over the next year? Takes a, takes a lot of the stress out of this game. Making one trade. One trade. So those are the three great advantages when you buy the option. Okay, Mark, you told me the good news about options. Now tell me the bad news about the option. The number one problem with any option you buy, and you've all heard it, is that 85% of all options you buy will expire worthless. So why would I have you spend $10,000 on something that's going to expire worthless 85% of the time? Well, when we buy this put option, what do we want to have happen to the value of the put? We want it to go worthless. We want corn to go higher. We want to be in that 85%. We want to watch that thing go worthless because then it means we've got higher corn prices out there. But what they don't tell you, one of my, all my competitors always moan about options expiring worthless. 85% of options expire worthless, but they never tell you what percent of options had good money in them at some point and you didn't take the money out before it goes worthless. So for example, this year when corn went to 318, if we had a $4 put on, if we didn't take some money out when it got down to 330 or 320, and that option could have been worth 70 cents on that October rally, we would have lost all that money. And that option could have expired worthless. So the fact of the matter is our job at Top Dirt is to help you manage that option as an asset. And our job is to pick you up, pick up the phone and call you and say, hey, we've got good money in this option. Now it's time to take some money out of it. And what we call rolling down and rolling up. If we talk about some things here that you don't understand, we have a book at the table. And Lisa is with me. Lisa, if you'll stand up real quick. She'll be, she's going to be here all day uh, in the, uh, at the table. I've got to go back to Chicago. She's a heck of a lot prettier to look at at me, so stop by and say hello to Lisa, and she'll get you the book and sign you up for the email if you want. But the fact of the matter is that we always have to contend with 85% of all options expiring worthless. The second problem with the option is you've got to pay for it. You've got to write out that check for $10,375. And you might say to me, you know what, Mark, I just don't have the cash right now. I've got my John Deere bill coming up, or I've got a seed bill I've got to pay. I just don't have the cash right now. That's when you have to have an ag lender who understands this and is willing to lend you the money. If you go into your banker and say to him, I want to borrow $10,000 to buy some put options, and if your banker says to you, I'm not going to lend you money on something that expires worthless 85% of the time, you need a new banker. And you call me up, and I guarantee you I can find you a banker within 25 miles of wherever you live in Alabama or any other ag state in this country and find you an ag lender who understands this. I work with hundreds and hundreds of ag lenders all over the United States who do understand this. But the fact of the matter is, you got to pay for it. The third problem with the option is they're not perfect. If you buy that December $4 put for 25 cents, well, from 420 where the market is today down to 375, don't expect that value of the put option to increase all that much. It'll slowly, as the market comes down, the value of that put will slowly increase. But once we get under 375, then it's going to pick up some steam. If we sell the grain at 420 and we buy that call, and let's say we buy a 420 or 450 call for 20 cents, well, from 420 up to 470, that call option isn't going to pick up much steam. But if we start getting over 470, it's going to start working very well for you. Don't expect the options to follow the futures market penny for penny. The options aren't perfect. And while we're on the subject, I'm not perfect either. You'll notice the name of my company says top third. It doesn't say top 1%. It doesn't say top 10 or top 20 or even top 30. It just says top third. So if I can get you guys from selling your grain in the bottom third and get you to the top third every year, year in and year out, no matter what these markets do, I believe I've done my job. If you say to me, you know what, Mark, that's not good enough. If corn goes from 420 to three bucks this year, if I don't get that whole dollar 20, you're no good to me. Well, I'm sorry, I can't help you then. But if I can get you in that top third every year and year in and year out, that's what I can do for you. Now, at top third, you're probably never going to hit the home run. 
the corn goes to seven bucks, you're probably not going to wind up with seven dollar corn, maybe 620 or 650 or some other number. If you want to swing for the fences, call one of my competitors. And while you're swinging for the fences, trying to hit that home run, what are you most likely going to do? Strike out. Well, at top third, you're never going to strike out. You're going to hit a lot of singles and doubles and maybe the occasional triple. But those are the pluses and minuses of the option. Now, why don't you guys use more options? Options haven't been around that long. When I went to ag school in the 70s, we didn't talk about options because we didn't have them. They didn't come in until the 80s. So I'm 60 years old. If you're 50 or older, it probably wasn't something you were raised with, talked about at the dinner table, because they didn't have them. But for some of you younger guys, you should have been exposed to some of this, and you should be working with these tools, and you older guys need to take some time to understand these options, because in my opinion, the option is the best tool ever invented for the American farmer to become a better marketer. Now, well, we've got one more here. Don't become a speculator. I don't want you guys trying to outguess this market. I don't want you reading the, the magazines. I don't want you to watch guys on television all telling you where they think the market's going to go. How many of you out there watch me on U.S. Farm, Port, Farm Report or Ag Day TV? Any of you? Quit watching me out there. That's where I tell you what I think and not what I know. And let me tell you, as soon as you hear any commodity broker say these two words, I think, hold on to your wallets. I think the reports are going to be bullish. I think there's going to be a drought this year. I think uh, there's going to be plenty of rain and rain, rain prices are going to two bucks a bushel. As soon as you hear a broker say, I think, hang up the phone on them. As your risk manager, I will never tell you what I think. I will only tell you what I know. I don't have a clue if corn is going to seven bucks this year or if it's going down to 250. I don't have a clue. Here's what I know. If you buy that $4 put for 25 cents, we're spending 25 cents to protect a buck and a half of risk. That's a six to one risk reward ratio. That's a trade we're willing to make. But you guys all want to try to speculate these markets and beat the pros and to outguess it and to listen to some broker or read somebody's uh, emails or whatever they put out there, the reports and all this nonsense that's out there. Does anybody here know the odds of you outside public beating the pros in Chicago as a speculator? Anybody know the odds? Anybody want to guess? 7%. 7% of all outside speculators can beat the pros in Chicago. Those are pretty lousy odds, aren't they? How many of you are going to raise grain in 2015 and haven't sold a pound of it? Well, what are you doing with all that grain that's in the bin and all that grain that you're going to raise next year? What are you doing with that grain right now? You're speculating with it. You're hoping that the price goes higher. What are the odds that you're right? 7%. We don't want you speculating with this grain. What is my job as your risk manager? My job as your risk manager is to identify the risks you have in growing corn, wheat, and beans, cattle, and hogs, cotton, rice, whatever it is, and to tell you what that risk is this year. And we've identified the risk, if you're growing corn in 2015, is that corn can go to 240 a bushel. Soybeans can go to 780 a bushel. Wheat can go to about four bucks a bushel. Cattle, pick a number. Now, I don't have a clue if that's where we're going, but that's the risk, and I'll show you where I get that risk in a second. So my job as your hedge manager is to identify those risks and protect you against that bad thing from happening to you. What's my job as your spec broker? Let's say you call me up and say, hey, Mark, you've been trading for almost 40 years now. You've had some success over the years. Can't we throw 20 grand into an account and make some money trading together? My answer is absolutely not. All you're going to do is lose your money. Because what is my job as your spec broker? And listen carefully to this, because I'm the only broker in the United States that will tell you the truth about this. What is my job as your spec broker? My job as your spec broker is to help you lose your money at a slower rate than you'd lose it on your own. Everybody understand that? We don't want you speculating. All you're going to do is lose money. Quit trying to outguess these markets. 
quit reading all the nonsense. Why I told you to quit watching me on TV? Because that's where I tell you where I think. And I can put that stuff out there and, and do it as well as any of those guys can. But the fact of the matter is, if any of us marketing gurus knew where the market was going, we wouldn't be telling you. We'd be long retired. I know some of the best traders in Chicago. My closest friend has been like a father to me. He's going to be 88 in two weeks. He's been a member of the Board of Trade over 55 years. One of the most successful traders that ever lived. Is he writing newsletters? Is he telling anybody what he's doing in the market? No. He wants to trade. We have a saying in Chicago, great newsletter writers write great newsletters. Great traders trade. So quit listening to all the nonsense that's out there. Identify the risks and manage that risk that's in front of you. Now, crop insurance, quickly. You, many of you found out that if you had crop insurance from 14, you didn't get much of a check, if any check. Because what's important to understand about the revenue insurance, it protects the dead bushels. If you grow the bushels and you're at above your, let's say your APH is 160, and you came in at 169 this year, you didn't get a check. You've always been told that if the prices go down, you're protected. It's nonsense. Yes, you get more bushels, but you get them at a lower price. So you have to identify what the crop insurance can do for you. We don't sell crop insurance at Top Third, so whatever you do there is your business. But keep in mind, the insurance will protect the bushels you don't grow. If it's hailed out, drowned out, droughted out, whatever it is, a marketing plan will protect your live bushels. Now, the hardest concept to grasp in buying options is that when you buy that $10,000 worth of options, you want to lose the money. That's the hardest part. But I said it's an insurance policy. Is there a married couple in the room? Do we have a married couple in the room? Anybody married in the room? No couples? OK. We'll, we'll, we'll pick on you. Do you have any life insurance? Do you want to lose the premium every year, or do you want your wife to collect on the policy tomorrow? <laughs> you understand that just fine. You want to lose the premium. I told you that this put option is an insurance policy. The hard part is you want to lose the premium. Everybody here, <coughs> excuse me, has car insurance. Anybody want to get into an accident on the way home so you can collect on the policy? Or do you want to lose the premium? You want to lose the premium. The hardest part about what I do is when you hand me that check for 10500 bucks, and I tell you, now don't forget, you want to lose every penny of this. When you say, yeah, Mark, I get it. I'm protected between now and next December. If corn prices go down, I'm protected. But if corn prices go up, I'm going to make a lot more money. Then I can help you. So you've got to understand that it that put option is an insurance policy. What are the two factors that determine whether or not the, the expense of the option justifies the risk? We have to have at least a three to one risk reward ratio before we'll buy any option. We just told you that if we buy the December put, the $4 put for 25 cents, it's protecting at least a buck and a half of risk. That's a six to one risk reward ratio. That's a trade we're certainly willing to make. But the number one factor to determine whether an option has worth are where are prices historically? Are we in the lower third, the middle third, or the upper third of historical prices? If we're in the upper third of historical prices, wouldn't that be a good time either to sell grain or to buy a put option and expect that it's got a good chance of paying off in case we go back to that bottom third? You bet. If you're selling grain here in the lower third of historical prices, wouldn't that be a good time to expect that that call option might pay off in case we go back up? Sure. Now, here's 30 years of corn. I don't have a clue. Right now, we've got December corn out here. at four, This is a monthly chart, so this is based off the March contract. But December is up here at about 420 bushel. I don't have a clue if we're going to five bucks, six bucks, or eight bucks this year, or ten bucks. I don't have a clue. What's the risk? Certainly down here around 240, 250 a bushel. That's the risk. Now here's December corn. Again, we're in this area here. We're going to get, we've already made some cash sales for 2015. If we get up in this range in here, 
we're going to certainly get more aggressive because we're not running out of grain anywhere around the world. And with the dollar as strong as it is, we want to look for opportunities to price it. In the meantime, we've got those $4 puts here for $0.25 cents in case we go to two fifty. Now, let's hope and pray for a rally. But while we're hoping and praying for a rally, we got that put option in our back pocket in case we go down. Here's soybeans. I don't have a clue if beans are going back up to 9 or 11 or 13 or 15 bucks, or they're coming down here to really, wait, wait what do you got here? No, I'm sorry, this is wheat. This is wheat. I don't have a clue if wheat's going back to 9 or 12 or 13 bucks, or if we're coming down here to $4 a bushel. That's the risk is $4 wheat. So if we can buy today a $6 July put for 30 cents, 35 cents, we'll spend that 35 cents to protect $2 of risk. That's a 5 to 6 to 1 risk reward ratio. We hope when we buy that $6 July put that the market goes up and we lose that 30 or 35 cents for that put option. But if wheat does go to 4 bucks, we're protected. Here's the July wheat. Again, we're over six bucks a bushel. I don't know if we're going to seven or eight or if we're coming down to four. We've just been to five not long ago. Can we go to four? You bet. So if we can buy that six dollar put today for 30 cents and put in a, six, seven, a 570 floor in on our wheat, we're protected in case we go back to five, let alone four. But if wheat goes to 650, seven bucks, eight bucks, great. If we get up in this Seven six seventy five range. We're going to be much more aggressive selling the cash. Once we sell the cash, then we can sell off those puts we no longer need. And then maybe if we close over seven bucks, maybe we'll buy a call option in case we go back to ten or thirteen bucks a bushel. Here's soybeans. Thirty years of soybeans. I don't have a clue. We're out here at about ten thirty. I don't have a clue if beans are going to sixteen or eighteen bucks, or if they're coming down here to eight bucks. God forbid it's five. Now you guys go stick another four million acres of beans in the ground next year. And if we have good yields in Iowa next year, in Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota, don't tell me that six dollar beans are out of the question. Go ahead, stick another four million acres in the ground, see what happens with good weather. But the fact of the matter is, if we can buy a ten dollar, what we call a ten dollar, eight dollar put spread, for fifty cents, and protect that two dollars, for fifty cent risk, that's a four to one risk reward ratio. That's a trade we're willing to make. Let's go back real quick, to corn. Why does this happen? Why do prices go up and down? What is the farmer response around the world the first time we had $4 corn back when the Russians were buying it? What was the response in 95 when the Chinese were buying the corn? What was the farmer response around the world at 550 corn? When we went to $8 corn, what was the farmer response around the world to $8 corn? Plant more corn. What's happening to demand at 8 bucks a bushel? That's going down. So you guys are about to raise more of what the world wants less of. What's likely to happen to price? Go down. And how far will it go? Within 18 months of any high, you've gone back under the cost of production. And why does that happen? Because if the prices didn't go back under the cost of production, you've had, you would have idiots like me from Chicago coming out in Iowa and paying 15 grand an acre for land and thinking this is easy. You've got to force out that inefficient producer, and how do you do it? You get the price back under the cost of production. It has always happened. It always will. So you've got to learn to take advantage of these rallies out here. Here's again, this is November uh, beans. We're out here 10.30ish roughly. You buy that $10, $8 put spread in case we go down. This is cattle, 30 years of cattle. Anybody got cattle in the room? Any risk in this cattle market? You tell me. Here's feeder cattle. Any risk in the feeder cattle market? 
You guys tell me. If you guys with cattle, if you don't buy a put option up here, go shoot yourself in a foot. I don't have a clue if cattle are going to two fifth eaters, are going to 250 or 275, or they're coming down to 200, let alone 175. God forbid it's 150, let alone if we come back to 100. How many people think that feeder cattle in the next 10 years could go back under 100 bucks? My, again, my client knows, and maybe one other gentleman. Let's take a look at it. That high is around 225 to 235. How low can it go? Here's cotton, 225 to 58. If you guys have cattle out there and don't buy these puts, shoot yourself in the head. I don't know if prices are going up or down or not, but I know these puts aren't cheap. For a feeder cattle put, it's $5 a hundred to get anything legitimate, which is a lot of money, $5 a hundred. But what's it protecting? It's protecting at least 25 bucks down to 200, let alone, a, let's just say it's just the 200. That's a five to one risk reward ratio. If we go to 150, I mean the numbers are astronomical on the risk reward ratio side. And when you spend that five dollars for the put, what do you want the feeder market to do? You want it to go to 250 or 275 and you want to lose that five dollars a hundred. But if somebody says mad cow, or if the economy collapses, or anything that can happen to this cattle market, which has happened in the past, happens, are you glad you got that 220 put on for five bucks a hundred? You bet. That's how you manage the risk. Now here are my current recommendations. We'd have 100% of the corn, wheat, and beans sold now. If you don't have it sold and you've got it in the bin, buy a March $4 put for 15 cents. If you sold the grain, buy a 440 call for 23. If you've sold the wheat from last year, buy a 650 call for 32 cents. For the soybeans, we'd have it sold now. If you've got it in the bin for whatever reasons, buy a May 1040 put for 50 cents. If you've got it sold, then buy a March 1070 call for 30. We can go through this at the table later if you want. New crop recommendations, we buy a September short dated December corn put. That means it goes off the December 15 price, but it expires in September. You can buy that $4 put today for 23 cents to protect all that downside risk. You can buy that July $6 put option for 40. You can buy that November $10, $8 put spread for 55 cents. Here's a marketing plan for every bushel of grain that you plan to raise next year. Cattle, you can, you can buy a 160 put for 425, these are just examples. You can buy the April feeder, 220, $2 put spread for five. That's a four to one risk reward ratio. On the hogs, you can buy an 84 put for 350, 100. This is how you manage the risk. You buy the put, hope the downside doesn't happen, but if it does, you're protected. The government makes me tell you I've just solicited your business. Past performance is not indicative of future uh, results there's risk of loss in trading futures and options. Obviously at top third, we would like to earn your trust over time. If you come on board with us, you open an account, we clear through RJ O'Brien. You work with one broker like Liesl in the office one-on-one. -on -one. She'll sit down with you and go through how many acres do you have, what's gonna be on those acres, what, what do you have in storage, if anything, where do you store the grain on farm or at the elevator, what's your local basis like, what kind of insurance are you gonna have for next year, what have you got sold, if anything? And then when we get all that information, we'd say, listen, if it was our grain in the bin or our grain that we're going to raise next year, here's what we would do. And you can say, all right, I'll trust you with 25% of my grain this year. That's fine. Give it a try. And we can start there. We believe that a relationship in marketing develops over time. It's not what I think the market's going to do in the next six months. It's about working with you day in and day out for the next 10 or 20 years where your kids are hopefully working with her kids someday. Now, we work with you one-on-one. -on -one. The only thing we ever charge you is $75 a round turn, $37.50 to buy the option. If we sell that option off, you pay us another $37.50. There's no acreage fees, there's no management fees, bushel fees, any of that nonsense. If you stop by the table, we'll sign you up 
as a courtesy for coming here today, take a look at my email every night. This is where we tell our clients what we know and not what we think. So if you want to see what we're telling our clients every day and see the recommendations and see what's going on in the markets and why they're doing what they're doing, it's a quick five minute read. In the beginning, I asked you to spend five minutes a day to become a better marketer. Stop by the table, sign up for that email, and let's start taking a look at it five minutes a day. Read that email every day. Uh, if you want to know what I think the market's going to do, you can go to AgWeb and listen to my audio comments out there twice a day. Would I bother listening to that? I wouldn't waste your time because that's where I tell you what I think and not what I know. But you want to read the email because that's where I tell folks what I know. Uh, we will tell you when to sell the cash grain. We don't charge extra for that. We'll tell, say today's a good day to sell 10% of your grain or 20%, whatever it is. And you can take that recommendation or not. Uh, you don't have to make any trades with us. You open up the account, you put $1,000 in there to open the account. That's your money. If you buy $10,000 worth of options, you need to send me a check for nine grand. Uh, if you don't make any trades in one year, we'll send you back your $1,000. You go your way, I'll go my way. But we will work with you every day. You can call in every day. You'll get the emails every night. And we'll try to get you involved in a good, legitimate marketing plan. We've got three minutes. Questions about anything we've talked about? We've gone through this very quick. Uh, questions about anything we've talked about? Come on, guys and gals. There's no tough questions. Yes. Your ten to eight dollar put spread. Yeah. Why? Why do you close that bottom? Just because that. Well, because that that ten dollar put by itself is about seventy five cents, and it's just too much okay. money to spend for a put. So we're really concerned about that next two dollars of risk. And let's say, for example, we go down to eight dollar beans, and that put spread is now worth two bucks or a little bit more, depending on how much time value is left in it. Nothing says we can't take the money out of that spread put that $1.75 net or whatever it is into your pocket, and now we might come out and buy a $7.80, $6 put spread for another $0.40 cents or something in case we continue to go down. But if we do go, you know, if it looks like you guys are going to plant another 4 million acres, the weather is good in June and July, and we're down there, you know, it's 8 bucks by July 15th or whatever, we're going to take that money out of that put because you still have an August weather to get through, and you could go right back up again if it's hot and dry. So we take that money out when it's available to us. And it's our job to tell you when to do that. Good question. One more. Anybody about anything? Come on, folks. There's no tough question. Nobody wants to ask the tough question. Gee, Mark, you had four open heart surgeries. What if you drop dead tomorrow? Legitimate question. We have 14 brokers in Chicago that work with this plan. We make the decisions as a team on when to and which option to buy. Some of these guys have more, as much experience as I do in the futures pits. Uh, we've got two guys that have spent 20, 25 years in the pits as professional traders. And we make all these decisions as a team. So hopefully, I named the company Top Third instead of Gold Trading or whatever, uh, because I want the company to go on long after I'm gone. And hopefully I'm here for a long time. Uh, when the Lord's ready for me, he's ready for me. Uh, but uh, hopefully it's not for a long time. But I want the company to go on long after I'm gone. So I named it Top Third, so the name and the reputation of the company stay intact. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.